it is going to get much worse. As a matter of fact, I don't even want to buy a piece of real estate until we see uh, mortgage rates over 10%. I want double digit uh, real estate over here. I believe it is going to get that bad. And the reason why is we have some factors that we have not seen in over 100 years. Welcome to What the Finance. I'm What the Finance founder, Anthony Fatsis. So while the Fed has undertaken the fastest increase in interest rates in history, the general consensus about the economy has remained steadfast. Unemployment remains at record, record lows. The economy grew in the fourth quarter despite recession fears and markets are up more than 10% year to date. Yet despite this, there are underlying warning signals in certain markets, which could be indicating worse things to come. This includes the auto and real estate markets. Two markets which have high exposure to interest rates and have really benefited off COVID and low interest rates over the past 10 years. Um, so I'm excited to talk further with our guests today about these markets and what they are, what they show about the real economy. So Economic Ninja, it's wonderful to see you. Thanks for joining us. Hey, thank you so much. Thanks for understanding that I'm literally driving around and doing this interview right now. So thank you. No problem at all. You're hard man to get. So <laughs> thank you for your time um, whenever we can. So I guess, it, can you give us a bit of an overview of those two markets, like the auto industry and real estate uh, industry? And I guess, you know, where you're seeing bad things to come? Yeah, totally. And this is what's really exciting. It, so this is a, a repeat of 2006 to 2008, however, on a much grander scale. And I'll give an example. In 2006, everybody here in crazy California, and I only say crazy just to mock the crazy people, but really it's, it's full of a lot of amazing, good-hearted, smart individuals. But in 2006, we were seeing people here in California buy up SUVs at record pace. Why? Because they just came off of a high of real estate exploding in price and in value. They were tapping into their equity line their home's equity and buying these massive vehicles that cost way more to drive than they were even worth per, you know, per mile. And what happened was by the time 2007, 2008 ran, rolled around, fuel prices had really started to spike in California. And we started to see people selling back their SUVs and droves and trying to buy up cheaper vehicles to drive, like little Honda Civics and things like that. And what that told me back then was that the consumer was tapped out. They knew that the gas was so expensive. It was so much of a part of their monthly budget that they couldn't deal with their more expensive uh, gas guzzling vehicle. So what they did is they sold it. This is like that on just crack, honestly. It, it's insane what we've seen, but we've never seen this type of monetary stimulus into the markets, uh, even, even when you know the Great Recession had started and, and the Federal Reserve was actually bailing in, bailing out banks. Uh, there was some stimulus. This was much bigger on a grander scale. And we saw people leverage the auto market even greater, which also caused speculation in the real estate market. So when we're starting to see auto sales collapse, we're starting to see real estate sales collapse. And the reason why real estate sales are collapsing is because people just don't have the money, right? But also because people that would be normally selling into the market, selling their homes at these high prices, they physically cannot sell their home, turn around and buy the house next door to them and, and, and live normally because everything else has gone up around them. So they have to stay in that fixed sort of shell. And what I believe is going to happen is we're going to start seeing more layoffs coming in the next couple of quarters. And we're going to start to see those sellers that couldn't sell be forced to sell and buy a rental be or move into a rental because they literally are losing their jobs or they're having to relocate. Yeah, because that's really when you see, I guess, the pain when people are forced to sell. I think it's something that we haven't seen yet because, you know, unemployment seems to be quite low in the US is at record lows. You know, it might still be that people are working two, three jobs to survive, but somehow they're surviving. But you think that that could get worse? Yeah. See, the problem is, is with US government numbers seem to be a little skewed. It's like when the president came out and said, oh, well, yeah, this was the definition of recession, but let's let's change it. Well, let me tell you this. They are literally changing the definition of unemployment right in front of your eyes, but they're little, they're not telling you. They're not coming right out and saying, well, unemployment meant this, and now it means this. They're doing it through uh, different ways of manipulating the numbers. And one great resource I found is John Williams' uh, website, Shadow Stats which shows how they change and manipulate these unemployment numbers. And what's really amazing to me is how much of a surprise it was to the upside, what, just merely a week ago. And what gets me excited is the reaction that the Fed's going to have to take. And they're going to sit there and go, sorry, our hands are tied. We have to raise rates more aggressively, more, I believe, even more than that 25 basis points, because the data is showing employment strong. 
I do not believe that employment is strong everywhere I go. As a matter of fact, I'm having worked on my house right now. We're still having a hard time getting labor, good quality labor, but also anyone to show up to a job. So I think that those numbers are skewed and that truth will come out by September. Yeah, it's really interesting. So, you know, you mentioned the auto industry in the US and I think it's quite a unique place. As you said, bigger, better, especially when times are good. People love to buy the, buy, buy the massive trucks. So is that why you're saying that, especially in the higher end vehicles, that's where there's going to be a massive, I guess, uh, shortage of buyers, but maybe in the lower end, it might not see that. So you mentioned the Corollas, uh, you know, in the UK they have Vauxhalls or I guess, yeah, or those types of cars. Yeah, so what's happening, and there's much better YouTube channels to follow than mine on this, but one of them is uh, Lucky Lopez on YouTube. Go check him out. He's a, a car dealer, has multiple dealerships in Las Vegas. Well, Las Vegas is known for excess, right? Now, he's been following the uh, auto industry, especially the uh, high-end luxury cars, the exotic cars, and those are dropping severely in price. And the reason why is because there's only so many people that can afford them. And once a certain amount of people understand, oh, there's something wrong, what do they do? They don't go and buy the next nice car. And he's on record just this last week, literally liquidating his entire personal fleet of vehicles because he believes so much that uh, because the exotic car market's falling, the next market you're going to see is vehicles like mine, the, the newer, bigger trucks, where um, they who has a hundred thousand dollars to pay for a truck? Honestly, I can turn around and go buy a used truck, even though it's overly inflated at sixty, seventy thousand dollars, put $30,000 savings in my pocket and get the same job done. So as you see those prices cascade and it moves into the higher end new vehicles, like let's see, Ford, Chevy, Dodge, things like that. What are the, those companies going to do? They're not going to stop selling. They're going to drastically reduce the price similar to what we saw Tesla do. Tesla was the first, had first market uh, mover advantage in the EV space. They drastically cut the price of cars. Now they're leaving companies like GM and Ford hanging out to dry because if they don't don't drastically drop their prices, they're going to be in trouble. They're going to lose a lot of market share. So I think it's very telling what's happening in the exotic world. Matter of fact, I think I told people I literally almost pulled the trigger on a Ferrari, a used Ferrari the other day because it was $45,000 for a beautiful mint condition, 1997. I don't remember the, the model number. I want to say it was a 344, um, a 348. I don't, I don't even remember the number. Sorry about that. But I literally almost pulled the trigger so fast because I'm like, how often do you see a, a mint Ferrari like that at 45? I actually called on it and it had already sold and it was already put up to 66 grand, but that car is now sat on the market for like, what was it a month now at $66,000. And again, that's very telling of the market. Yeah, exactly. As you said, there's just the, the buyers aren't coming through. So if we look at your thoughts on the overall, overall market in general, is it really linked to that unemployment? Is it really linked to the, you know, is it sort of similar trends, I guess, equities or what, what are you thinking in that regard? No, so really all markets go up and go down on based on human emotion, right? If you feel good about your position in life, how much money you're making, but even, even not that, like, let's say you don't make a ton of money, but you feel that the economy is growing. You're more likely to sign up for a credit card. You're more likely to go out and get a home loan because you feel that if the economy keeps going good, then the house will be worth more in the future. What's happening right now is more and more humans around the world are starting to realize that this, a lot of this is fake. A lot of this is made up. And, and the truth is in the numbers in like YouTube and social media outlets, um, since uh, everything got shut down a couple of years ago, the information exchange was expansive uh, to say the least. Uh, knowledge and truth was shared at a level I believe in the last three years that hasn't been seen ever in history around the world. And so what we're seeing is a more educated investor. And then we're also seeing investors that again, like we talked about are tapped out uh, rents too high prices on food are getting exorbitantly high. Um, and what they're doing is they're starting to take a bigger picture and go, wait a minute, food doesn't seem to be going down. Car prices don't seem to be going down. And what's happening is they're starting to regress. And what most people understand there's a time lag between uh, an event happening, and then when it reaches you, your household, your life, and that time lag could be anywhere between a quarter, usually it's two quarters of economic data, or it could be two years, like what happened in 2006 when the housing market actually crashed, but it took two years for it to hit Wall Street, right? So people don't understand that time lag. So when I explain things like diesel shortages, you should go out and buy diesel because it's going to go up in price. And I get most of my comments are, I mean, honestly, stupid comments. Well, there's still diesel at my, my, my gas station. I go, 
that's not a shortage. There's always going to be everything available in this world. It's going to be at what cost, what price. And when there's less of something, it goes up in price if, if uh, supply and demand doesn't change. Or I'm sorry, if demand doesn't change. If demand's there for something, there's going to always be something at a certain price. But people don't understand the difference between shortage and actually being out of something. Yeah, definitely. And everyone's talking about, I guess, the uh, reduction in inflation, disinflation we've experienced over the past few months, but it's still at close to 6%, which is very high. So, Yeah, but let's let's throw this out there because I've talked about this before. I actually did a video that said deflation starts today, and that video was actually a year ago. And I got mocked and ridiculed like crazy. And what I tried to explain was deflation starts in low-hanging fruit in every human's budget. So I'll give you an example. As house price living expenses and food expenses go up, what happens is the first thing you do is you start to to say, you know what, I seriously, I don't need two cell phone charges. There are literally people that have, you know, cell service for their cell phone and their watch. They go, all right, cut that out, cut out the watch. Um, I don't need Netflix or, or literally 15 different subscription services. And they start to cut those out. And that's where we see deflation start. Then we see deflation come into travel and leisure. Then we see deflation come into other things. And then finally it hits the, the big ones, household, like living expenses. Well, now we're seeing rent decreasing around the country in the hot, hot areas. And it sounds funny. I always get those comments like, well, rent's not you know, going down here. And I go, well, where do you live? And they live in a town that has only a handful of rentals. I'm like, well, of course it's not going down there. Like, let's, let's put on our thinking caps. So we are seeing those deflationary downtrends, but the problem is right now, and this is something the government and the central banks around the world are having a problem with, uh, it's still showing up as inflation across the board because in energy and food costs are through the roof and they're going to get worse in the next few quarters, especially if we have another uh, military uh, operation between a couple of countries, like what's going on in Russia and Ukraine. Um, so that's the problem. They're, they're having, we're seeing deflation already starting, but inflation is so strong in, in sectors that people don't have a choice. They have to eat, they have to live somewhere. That's where the governments are having a problem. And like uh, Powell just said, he goes, we're already starting to see deflation, but we don't think the job is complete yet. And that's because he's literally not trying to tell you the truth. What I'm telling you, it's because energy and food, that's the scary two things, but it only leads to great opportunities for us. Yeah. But it also it almost exacerbates the issue when it keeps, if he keeps increasing rates and then he keeps, uh, you know, keeps uh, re removing those buyers of these assets that maybe uh, did really well during the boom. And now there's not going to be anyone. So then they bust. Well, the sad thing is there is going to be someone, and that is banks are going to be buying up real estate as it crashes. And the sad thing is banks are going to get money from your pension funds. And that's that's the thing that I've been trying to warn everyone about and get everyone ready. I don't want banks buying up all the homes around the world and turning them into rentals for you. I want you owning five to 10 homes a piece. And then I want you to be a good human being, a good landlord, and then not only help other people get back on their feet, then teach them how to become rich themselves. And that's how I've I've become so sex successful in my life because of helping other people. And many people don't understand that. You know, we always see greedy people get rich or people that are thieves get rich. It always seems like, and you're always wondering, well, why not me? Well, the reason why is because you just haven't stood out and not only helped others. Now I know people, like, oh, yeah, I help people all the time. I go, but when you help other people get rich, you become wealthy. I know it sounds crazy, but I believe it's literally a law just like gravity. When you help other people make money, money flows into your hands in so many different ways. Yeah, it's a great message, message to have. So I guess from your perspective in the long term, as you're saying, you think it's, uh, things are going to get worse in the uh, current economy and then that's going to amplify into all the other markets. Yes, it is going to get much worse. As a matter of fact, I don't even want to buy a piece of real estate until we see uh, mortgage rates over 10%. I want double digit uh, real estate over here. I believe it is going to get that bad. And the reason why is we have some factors that we have not seen in over 100 years. You know, we have a war cycle that's hitting us right now. But we also have inflation that we didn't have before the Great Recession, it, a heavy inflation. And we also have these, with the war cycle, these geopolitical and supply chain risks, like what people witnessed with the natural gas prices um, and the fertilizer issue 
issues and the lack of being able for farmers to grow crops simply because of either it's true and literally Ukraine just supplied the world with all this stuff, which isn't true, or it was the narrative that was used to, um, let's say, an excuse to get away with a lot of stuff behind the scenes. And so I believe that's actually going to get worse. I mean, we still haven't even seen China and Taiwan ramp up yet, but the rhetoric's there. They're they're pounding those war drums. China's been very clear of their intentions. And um, we also see what we never saw in the last 100 years, and that is the East and the West separating financially right now. So it's Canada, Europe, and the US versus the rest of the world, literally. And uh, I don't know who you're betting on, but I'm going to be honest with you. I think that the rest of the world is going to shake the Western uh, uh, alliances in ways that they don't even see coming right now. Yeah, it's scary to think. And I guess if we go back to real estate as well, uh, you know, probably most of the buyers of the real estate in a lot of these countries, the US, Canada, uh, Australia, UK, and Europe is these, uh, you know, Canadians, you say Middle Eastern, uh, a, a lot of these, uh, a lot of this currency has gone into those countries and bought the real estate. And then those other countries yes. as well, they've actually uh, have, they're not like as lucky in the US where it's 30 year fixed rates, they have variable rates. So within two or three years, people are going to have to change the interest they're paying back. So that's going to have a massive impact on, you know, whether they can, they're forced to sell or not. Yep. Yeah. It's, it's really sad. I did a video on Canadian real estate market. It really does make me sad because, you know, China has been allowed for decades to run in there and just bid up the prices of homes. Sorry if you hear beeping my, my cell phone's going off right now. (laughs) That's what happens when you drive around as you're moving studio. Um, But really with those short term loans, and I know you have them in the, uh, Uh, UK as well, it really does not give opportunity for people to get ahead or to pay off the real estate. So that's why I've been jumping on the precious metals bandwagon, because to be honest with you, as currencies collapse and don't, they're not going to go away. It's like a shortage, right? It never goes away. You're always going to have a dollar. You're always going to have European currencies. They're just going to be different colors next time and mean something different. But every time that's happened, precious metals have not only held their value, they've exceeded, they've done better as compared to the currency uh, value in relation to inflation. And I'm not a financial advisor. I've always got to say that, right? I'm just an investor. And I keep looking at all the world separating right now and going, all right, what's the best plan? And I'm like, if I can hold on to my net worth while everyone else around the world's losing it, so I'd use gold as, a, as an on-ramp, right? And an off-ramp. Then when prices of homes fall and banks are trying to buy them up, then I want to be able to either myself and teach other people how to buy up real estate as fast as we can as well. Sorry, I'm jumping all over the map, but you, as you ask questions, all these thoughts are hitting my head at the same time. You know, it's okay. It's really interesting. So I guess from your perspective, say, you know, we do get the crash. And as you said, you're quite prepared for that. Is there anything that would maybe convince you that maybe we don't get there and maybe the thing's going to be okay? Is there like an indicator yes. or anything? Yeah. No. So nothing is ever okay. I want people to understand that there is a recession every seven to 10 years. It's guaranteed. There is also a large financial correction every 50 to 100 years. All right. hundred years ago, what started uh, the depression in 1920? A flu. You can't deny this stuff. Then uh, after the depression in 1920, they got out of that by rapid money printing, which led to literally a decade of excess. Then we had the crash of 33, right? Or 29. Um, We are in a compressed version of time, literally like what's going on. And the reason why is two things. And that sounds funny. Days are getting shorter because the earth has tilted off its access axis. And because honestly, uh, the invention of the internet and uh, financial tools are making information move so much faster. So we are literally in that compressed amount of time. There is zero chance we don't go through a massive, massive correction on the same scale as the Great Depression. However, with that being said, it will be a steeper, faster, but shorter lived. It won't take 14 years from peak to peak, right? To go from peak to trough to peak to recover, it will be shorter because of the more advanced financial tools. But what will happen on the outside of this is, are you going to be able to take advantage of literally the greatest opportunity in your life? Or are you going to just become a victim of it and possibly get paid by the government to sit on your butt for a while? Um, That is the truth. There is literally no escaping this. Now, a lot of people would say, hey, you're doom and gloom. And I said, no, I literally just look back in history. If you you aren't bright enough to look back in history, you're not going to be able to see the future. It's literally that easy. And um, I get hit with that all the time. But I think this is the greatest opportunity of our lives. That's why I have a hard time. I bring sad doom and gloom and people tell me all the time, like, you know, the ninja has a way of bringing you horrible news, but then making you feel good about it. I'm like, it should make you feel good. It's like sitting on a railroad track and train is coming towards you and you see the train and all you go is, well, I'm just going to step aside because the train ain't going to stop. 
I'm not going to win that fight. Let the train get back. Go past me. I'm going to get back on and keep cruising. And I have a hard time not smiling and laughing. Uh, and while I'm trying to warn people um, that this is literally how life works, but so many people have to have that paradigm shift. And so that's why there's no way of getting out of this. Now, I will answer the second part of your question. There is one way that the government extends it. And this is how. The gov our U.S. government, so the Fed still runs the world. The U.S. is still the reserve currency, even though we are breaking apart, right? Um, the wealth effect that is the greatest wealth effect in on Earth is the real estate wealth effect. And the government knows that, and the Federal Reserve knows that. They can simply change the 30-year government-backed loan product to a 50-year-backed government loan product, meaning that you could get very close to the current interest. So let's say mortgage rates are 6% right now. I'm just throwing out numbers. They could turn around tomorrow and say, you know what? We're going to back a 50-year mortgage, and now the interest rate is 6.5%. And what that would do is it would drastically change. It would lower the price for your mortgage, right? But you'd become a slave for an extra 20 years. And you would probably literally pay for your house another one and a half times more than you were paying for the 30 year. OK, total debt slavery. That is one way that they could change this right now, turn it on its access. And that's uh, access. And that is why I'm trying to get people prepared. If that happens, there's going to be some things that you have to do, even though you believe this whole system's rigged. You can't fight the Fed sometimes or ever. And you can't fight. Uh, human emotion and all those human beings diving into real estate when all of a sudden, again, they want to you know, impress people they don't even respect and they want to get that bigger house. So there's also going to be a way to make money from that. So whichever way the government moves, I've usually got about a way or two that we're going to make money from it, but you have to be nimble and ready for that. Yeah, that's the key thing. Uh, it sounds like a nightmare situation, the second one. So let's hope that doesn't doesn't happen. Uh, but yeah, Egan, yeah. I'm gonna just, thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it. So I guess my last yeah. message is what is one uh, message you want people to take away from that conversation? You know, my thing is really, this is a, in the last three years, to say that you should know now who you should be friends with, who you should be family with, you know, who you should be aligning up with mentally, spiritually, emotionally, all that kind of stuff, doing business with is an understatement. Take the last three years is not only a great learning uh, lesson, but the greatest opportunity of your life. And this is literally on you. No one's going to do the hard work for you. It's going to take hard work to make wealth. But during a crash, more people get wealthy during a collapse of an economy than they do during the up, up uh, shot of an economy. And I want people to understand how big of a deal that is. So you literally you don't have a lot of chances left. That's what I'm saying. Like I made money during the dot-com crash. I made money during the real estate crash. Uh, I've also made it before both sides, but nothing compared to when everybody was selling their homes for cheap, selling their cars, liquidating everything. I was buying things for pennies on the dollar and then turning around and selling it to people that had money. And that's what I want for people to do is get ready for this opportunity. Don't get into more debt, get out of debt, and then literally start to save money, have cash on the side, getting ready to interject, inject it into the economy when everyone's panicking it's a great message segue so thank you so much for your time uh so you have a youtube channel is there anywhere else people can find what you do i'm all over twitter i'm uh at economy ninja and i'm um, at economic ninja i got two channels over there and then yeah i'm just pretty much everywhere I'm, I'm, i want to go big so it's yeah. like go big or go home with me <laughs> thanks yeah, exactly. so much man no th th thanks for your time really appreciate it right on Thank you so much for listening and if you enjoyed the episode, please subscribe and click the bell icon so you are notified when new podcasts are released. I hope you are leaving with some great value about investing, trading and finance. See you on the next show.